It is a great privilege for me to be here with you. I always have a tremendous burden in my heart for young men, especially in this time in which we're living, when the world is in an upheaval, when nations are being cast down, rulers are being turned over to foolishness, and God continues to reign. These are the worst of times. These are the best of times. Because I serve a king whose kingdom never ends. I serve a king who is incorruptible. I serve a king who has proven himself to me by his own blood on the tree. I serve a king who has never failed me in the few years that I have walked upon this earth. Though all hell break loose, I am encouraged and I am strengthened, not by some inner will, not by some inner force, but by the grace of God, knowing that whatever comes, whatever comes, my Lord reigns and his kingdom is just. And I'm here today, this evening. Now, I, I'm, I don't care about words. Matter of fact, I'm so tired of so many words with so little power. I'm here today, young person. That you might be transformed. That you might be changed. That you might become something you're not. That you might belong to him. Truly belong to him. Lock, stock, and barrel. Every part of you. That you would stop being a child. That you would stop acting like silly little boys. That you would become men. Men. But true men, not conformed to the image of some silly superhero that is neither a hero nor super, but conformed to the image of Christ. And conformed also to that long train of men that for the last 2,000 years have laid down their life for him. Even now in many of the countries where we work at Heart Cry. Constantly, we're staying on the phone. We're staying in communication because brothers are suffering. Brothers are being put in prison. Brothers are dying. A young man, 21 years old, a few weeks ago, who works with our missionaries in Myanmar was shot to death. Now, put that in light of this, your video games. My wife always says this, if a man-eating lion got loose in the United States of America, it would starve to death because there aren't any men to eat. I travel through the Middle East. I travel through Asia. I travel through Africa. I see 15-year-olds, 14-year-olds, 16-year-old men. And I come back here and I find 35-year-old boys There needs to be a wake-up call, a wake-up call. But it is not gathering you together and turning you into some kind of self-willed, self-strengthening soldier. We don't need that kind of men. We need men who depend upon Christ and seek to be conformed to the image of Christ and are dedicated to Christ. We don't need muscles. We don't need strength of will. We need men who know the word of God and depend upon it. That's what we need. I'm always reminded of a, um, a man, young man, that I knew that went into the jungle with me several times. And there are places in the jungle that literally I've seen men break down in tears. They can't go anymore. But it really doesn't matter 
because they're so deep in that even if they took off at that very moment, they still wouldn't make it out for seven or eight days. They feel like they're in the middle of hell. And this one man would go in with me, this one young man. He was scared of his own shadow. If the boat broke down and we had to jump out in the swamps and get under the boat and clean it off, he was terrified to do it. If we were hiking through the jungle, he was terrified of the snakes and the spiders and everything else that could get him. But I so appreciated that young man. Why? Because he did it anyways. Even though he was so afraid, so timid of everything, he did it out of love for Christ and out of love for souls. We need soldiers. We need young men willing to die. Because I want you to know that in this world today, all over the world, there are young men your age in prison who will die but will not back up. Not because they have muscles and can deadlift 405 pounds. It's because they love Christ and Christ loves them. And some of you young men need a kick in the pants. You need to stop being babied. While the world is about to tear us apart, we can't even decide what bathroom to go in. We need men. We need men. 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 And I want to tell you something. The state of things right now, it'll take a great move of God to find any. But nothing is impossible for God. And know this. Although there's just, compared to the population of the world, there's just a few young men here. God doesn't even need all the young men here. Just give me one. Just give me one. Just give me one. And God can use that young man to change the world. He can use that young man to change the world. And again, it's not about strength. It's about him. And we're going to see that tonight. We're going to see that tonight. Before, well, let's... Let's just take a look at 2 Corinthians 5. That's what was talked about earlier. Let's just go to it. Verse 1, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Young man, look at me. Look at me. I'll be 60 in a few months. I'm not going to get any stronger. I'm not going to get any faster. It was said of Robert Murray McShane that God gave him a message and a horse and he killed the horse. Just pouring himself out. There's not a whole lot left of me. I'm more metal than I am bone on the inside. My life, it seems like yesterday. I was nine. A few hours ago, I was 40 and in my full strength. And now I'm almost 60. And tomorrow, I will die. Nothing lasts. He said, for we know if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down. It's not if, it's when. It's when it is torn down. Everything you can live for in this world will be torn down. Everything. If you have a handsomeness about you, you will become ugly. If you are strong, you will be weak. If you are fast, you will be slow. If you are rich, you will die. Why would anybody live for this? Why would anybody have ambition for this? Life is this fast. It is so fast. And so few years are lived in full strength. 
And then there's the decline. And then there's death. Verse two, for indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. In so much as we, having put it on, will be found naked. Now, listen to me. You take the, the greatest athletes that were great athletes when, when I was 20. They were amazing. They were, on, they were posted everywhere. They were on TV. They were praised. They were applauded. They were champions. They were heroes. Now they're 60 and they're old and broken. And no one knows their name. Maybe they have a few Super Bowl rings put in a drawer or in a cabinet. The best of everything for them is gone and it will never return. My best has not even begun. Do you see that? Every day I get older, every day I get weaker, and every day I get closer to glory. We were driving here and there was this beautiful scenery over, over the mountains. And, and the guys were talking, look how beautiful that is. And I says, the, the most beautiful scenes of earth are God's garbage can. Heaven's garbage can. Ear has not heard, eye has not seen. It cannot be comprehended by the mind of, of angels or seraphs or men. The glory that awaits those who made Christ and Christ's service their ambition. Yes, I groan. And if God gives me your, more years, I will groan even more. But I groan with hope, knowing one day the mortality will be swallowed up in immortality. The corruptible and incorruptibility. Do you see that? What a hope I have. What a hope all the servants of Christ have. And that's what I want you to see, young man. Everything is fleeting. Everything is wrong. Everything is shadow. Until you set your heart, your mind, your life on Christ. That's all that matters. It's all that matters. He said in verse four, for indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. There were two philosophers years and years ago that commonly debated one another, one being Christian, the other one being atheist. It is said that on the deathbed of the atheist, he said, my life now is like an autumn leaf. It falls to the ground, it crumbles, and it is no more. The Christian on his deathbed said, my light, my light, my light is being put out. Because the sun is rising. The sun is rising. Oh, I want you to see eternity. I want you to see that what you see is not real. What is real? What God hath said. What God has promised. What God has done in Christ. That is real. Verse five, now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God who gave to us the spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Now, I, I just want you to look at something here. Good courage. Good courage. You see, it, it's not difficult to have good courage when everything is going Wonderfully. It's not difficult to have good courage when the world lies at your feet. It's not difficult to have good courage when you find yourself 40 in, the, in your full strength as a man. 
But there's going to come a time when all those things can no longer give you good courage. What then? The word of God. God's promises. And as he says here, God's spirit that is given as a pledge. The kindnesses of God. The mercies of God. Young people, I have walked with him for three and a half decades. I find that every time I talk about him, I want to start with an apology. Because no matter how hard I try, whenever I talk about him, his goodness, his kindness, his tender mercies, his power, his faithfulness, I get angry with my own language. It's just not sufficient. I cannot comprehend even his goodness to me and what I have comprehended, I can't communicate to you. The God that I am calling you to serve. The God that I am begging you to believe in. I cannot exaggerate him. I cannot. I can't tell you the tenth part. He is infinitely greater than his mercies that he has shown me and that I understand. And yet those mercies are so wonderful. His love is so great. His faithfulness so sure that sometimes in the night watch, I feel like my heart is going to explode. He is so good that sometimes you find yourself on your knees going, Lord, this is wrong. This is just wrong. You shouldn't be this good to someone like me. Oh, how I understand Peter that day on that beach, in that boat, when the Lord said, cast that net over. He casts it over and he draws those fish in. And what does he do? He falls down and says, depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And what he's basically doing is, Lord, you must not know who I am. To let me see this kind of glory. It's just not right. You're just too good. I would give anything for those I love. I would give anything for you to understand that. To see that. Because that's the thing that propels your heart. Why do men go into jungles? Why do they rest their life? Why do they go to prison? Why do they suffer poverty, humiliations, false accusations, everything else? Why? They're overwhelmed by the goodness and kindness of God. Someone asked me while we were driving over here, what do you think? You know, you've seen so many things. You've seen suffering. You've seen people suffer. You're dealing with people who are on the verge of death or getting arrested and all these different things in different places. Say, how do you deal with that? And then look at Americans that even think that the little nonsense that's going on now is persecution. And I said to them this, you don't understand. Those people in prison, those people who are dying right now as we speak, they're just like us. They're not special. They're not greater than us. Then what is it? To the degree that a man or a woman needs God, God gives them God. God strengthens his people. God makes his people stand. God does it for his own glory. God does it for his people's good. What would I have to live for if I wasn't a Christian? 
if I wasn't serving the Lord. I dread opening my eyes in the morning sometimes because the pain is so bad. I don't even want to move. What would I have to live for? Youth is gone. What do I have to live for? Oh, I am more encouraged now than I have ever been in my life. Why? Because I see God more clearly than I have ever seen him in my life. You see, you look down through history and you see all those great Christians. Young people, listen to me. You see all those great Christians, those who have suffered, those who have died, those who have served. And you think, what made the difference? Well, know this. They were born out of the same stock as, as us. They're children of Adam. And their conversion, the work of the Holy Spirit in regeneration, was not any greater in them than it is in us. Then what was it? They saw more of him. The more you see of him, the more you are encouraged. And the more you study the word, the spirit of God, of which Paul speaks here as a pledge, the more you study the word, the more the spirit of God takes the word and reveals to you Christ. And the more you see of Christ, the more you're driven, the more you're strengthened. Paul goes on and he says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. Why? Why? Why did God have it this way? Well, let's go back to the garden. Why did God point to a tree and say, don't eat of that tree? Because the day you eat of it, you'll die. The tree was beautiful. And it seems the tree probably tasted good. The fruit of that tree tasted good. It was maybe the most beautiful tree, the most beautiful fruit in the garden. It was, it was counterintuitive. Why would that tree kill me? Why? No theologian that I know believes the tree was poisonous. Why did God do it this way? When Adam and Eve looked at the tree, it would have seemed beautiful, fruitful. It looked tasty. Why can't I eat of it? Because God said so. And what is God doing? God desires one thing from you and I above everything else to believe him. Because that is the way we honor his character. That is why he has it that we walk by faith. I have never seen Jesus. But I know him intimately. By faith. But know this young person. Faith is an absolute impossibility apart from the revelation of God. God's word. What makes a young man strong? The word of God, reading the word and reading the word and meditating upon the word and memorizing the word and obeying the word and training yourself in the word, the word, the word, the word, the word. You don't know me like I know me. I really know me. And when I tell you this, know it, it's not an exaggeration. So full of fear. I don't even think you would believe me. So full of fear. Well, then how? How do you preach like that? How do you do those things? Anyone can be strong when Christ is standing beside them, when Christ is dwelling within them. We are not his champion. He is ours. I am a farm boy from Illinois. I'm not trained in the military, but I've been in, in the middle of a war. I'm not, 
uh, Indiana Jones. I don't know how to survive alone in deep, deep jungles, but I've been there, stayed there, and came out. Do you know how? Whether it was inner city or wherever it was, the reason I was able to do what I could do is because I was always with men from those places, tribal men and inner city guys and everything else that knew exactly what they were doing. And as long as I was with them, I could do anything. And young men, that's what you need to see. It's not about the strength in yourself. It's not about self-will. It's not about courage that comes from within you. No, it's about the reality of the Christ who walks with you. I can do all things through Christ. All things within his will can be done in his name, according to his plan, in his will. God always chooses the runt of the litter. Always. He won't have it any other way. Just look throughout history and you will see it. Look throughout history and you will see it. He's going to defeat the Midianites. So he goes to the smallest tribe, the smallest family, and takes a kid hiding in a wine vat. And then when he raises an army that technically was rather small, God says it's too big. When he calls that army, God says it's still too big. Then he gets 300 men to go against thousands upon thousands. He gives them clay pots. Why? He tells us why. So that when the battle is won, everyone will know who won the battle. This is not about you winning the battle. This is about Christ winning the battle and using the weakest person he can find to do it so he gets the greatest glory. We walk by faith. You so need the word of God, young people. I wish that, that I was converted young, but I know in God's providence there is wisdom. But oh, to be converted young. Oh, to have a father or preachers begging you as young men to lay aside the foolishness of this world and give yourself to the study of God's word so that you will become strong. And it's the only way you're going you're gonna to survive this culture of yours. This culture that seeks to make you puny and pathetic and effeminate and weak wants you to remain boys all your life. The only way you're going to break free from that is the word of God. The word of God. The word of God. They said of John Bunyan that if you cut his arm, he would bleed the Bible. A tinker. No formal training. And yet even the great John Owen admired him. The word of God. This is what you need. People today talking about faith, 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 and they know not what they're talking about. Let, let me give you an example. If you'll turn with me to Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now here's what I want you to see. If I pull this verse out of its context, I can turn it into an absurdity. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Okay? I hope to fly unaided by a mechanism. I sincerely hope to fly. And you know what? Tonight I'm assured that I can. I just have an assurance deep within my soul. In my heart of hearts. I am completely assured now that I can fly. So I climb to the top of this building and I do a Peter Pan right off the top of it. And I'm dead. But that's exactly what Hebrews is telling me to do. If I take this out of context. The conviction of things not seen. I have never seen anybody fly unaided. Never. But I have the strong conviction that I can. So again, I climb up the top. Peter Pan off the top. And I'm dead. But I did exactly what Hebrews 11, 1 is saying. If I take it out of context. Because you see, faith is an absolute impossibility apart from the revelation of God. Not a subjective revelation 
given to your heart of hearts are imposed upon your mind, but the written word of God. How do you stand fast? You stand fast by faith. Paul walked by faith, but faith is impossible apart from the word of God. You want to be strong in faith? Be strong in the word. Gather up all the promises of God and believe every one of them. So Paul said that he walked by faith. Let's go on. Again, verse 8, we are of good courage. And I say, prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Home with the Lord. Home with the Lord. It won't be long. But you know what? I, I don't. I'm speaking in human terms, but. I would hate to go home and be with the Lord. Knowing. That I never fought. That I never bled that I never swung a sword. I just don't want to. Men, how do you want to go home? On a bed of flowers? Having lived an easy life? That's not what men do. That's not what men do. How do you want to go home? My wife has such a sense of humor. There's been times I've had to, she knew, leaving the house, I was going into a battle. And I could still see her one time sticking her head out the door and she goes, Spartan, come back carrying your shield are being carried upon it. I remember one time coming home and I was really down and she said, what's wrong? And I said, man, I am getting attacked everywhere. They've made a video against me. They're doing this. I sometimes just want to give up. You know what she did? I imagine what your wife would do. She'd put her arms around you and console you. <laughs> My wife looked at me and said, well, you know what you need to do? You just need to man up and go back out there. How do you want to go home? Let me share with you. Just, just listen. This is one of my favorite texts in the whole Bible, young men. Young men, I wish you could catch this. Because I want to tell you something, young men. Also, evangelicalism has become effeminate. And I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. It's pathetic. Anemic. And we're not supposed to be rude. We're not supposed to be crash. We're not supposed to be mean spirited. We're not supposed to be quarrelsome because we don't even qualify then as a minister of Christ. But we're to act like men. And one of my favorite texts is this to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory, honor and immortality. Think about that. The Olympians, they're honored, aren't they? They get a little piece of gold, and I'm not even sure if it's gold, hung around their neck. They get applause for a moment, and then it's gone, and no one remembers them. Even the men, the great men like my father who fought in World War II and came back, or the men who went to Vietnam or Korea and all these places and came back, and no one was there to greet them. After such sacrifice, and some came to greet them in order to not to applaud, but to attack. But we have the opportunity to fight a battle. 
Not for a corruptible nation whose time is only a moment in history, but for an incorruptible kingdom and an incorruptible glorious king. And if there was ever a, an opportunity to lay down your life for something that mattered, it's now. It's him. It's him. Look at that. I love that. What are you doing? I'm seeking glory and honor and immortality. I'm seeking to finish the race. I'm seeking to fight the good fight. This type of thing is what makes men act like men. There's a reason to be alive. There is a reason to be alive. Sadly, most men never know that reason. In verse 9, he says, Therefore, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Isn't that amazing? That's, that's all that consumed Paul. It's imperfectly, of course, but it is all that consumed our Lord perfectly. His food was due to, to do the will of his Father who sent him. And Paul, seeking to imitate Christ, we can see the same in limited degree. Therefore, we also have as our ambition. I hear people say all the time, I'm an ambitious man, or that's an ambitious young man. You can be ambitious for very stupid things. I heard a story of one uh, lord or dignitary or royalty in England that was worth a fortune, and he had as his one goal of life was to grow, breed a guinea pig that would have a perfect figure eight on its back. Probably some of you are doing something quite similar. <laughs> a car, a house, a comfort, a reputation. Really? Really? This thing that God is doing is epic. It's epic. It's the thing. It's the thing. And it's an opportunity for us to live. To live for something. And to make it our ambition to please him. When you make it your ambition to please him, it frees you from trying to please anyone else. Now, I want, to, I want to look at two things. I just have about five minutes here, but I want to look really carefully at two things. I want to look at two ambitions, a greater light and a lesser light. One is the sun, the other is the moon. They're both a light, but in different degrees. Paul's first motive Behind his ambition, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Wow. Such a reality here. And it is very difficult at times to hold this in attention. We are absolutely and perfectly accepted in the beloved. We will receive a welcome into heaven as those loved of God. We are perfectly righteous in Christ. All that must be affirmed, all a work of grace. Yet at the same time, I will give an account for my life. I know a man, he's a dear friend of mine and a mentor, Angel Comenares, in Peru. I told a filmmaker one time, look, you need to, uh, he was going to go to one of the, the largest mission conferences in the history of South America. And I said, instead of going there, come with me to the mountains of Peru. Before we left from the coast, we met Angel there and 
he said, I need to find a battery. So we went out. We're looking in this dump for a battery. This little tiny Peruvian man. And the filmmaker's looking at me and he goes, I'm supposed to be in the greatest mission conference in the history of South America and I'm walking around a garbage dump with this little man looking for a battery for him to power his little speaker so he can preach when we go up in the mountains. I said, wait for it. Just wait for it. Next 48 hours, we traveled in the back of grain trucks, in the back of cattle trucks, by mule, by foot. And I'll never forget that guy's face when we crested over that last hill. And there was about 1,500 mountain men and women waiting. At, at the most conservative estimate, I believe that that man left in his wake about 350 churches. Very little education. Very little anything. Except a love for souls and a belief that the word of God was inspired, inerrant, infallible, and all-sufficient. Yeah, if you want to know what is a kind of a connecting thing between all men that have been used of God, it's that. And what I'm trying to say is, he had nothing of many of the good things we, we have. And yet, look what was accomplished through him. And I'm going to stand beside that man on the day of judgment. And I'm going to have to answer for all the good things, all the books I've had, all the opportunities to learn, all the great sermons I've been able to listen to, all the wonderful men that have influenced my life, everything. Did I just grow fat? Or did I respond as that man? I could take you all over the world to indigenous missionaries that we support and the TMAI guys that we support in different places. And you would just, I hope it would make you see, I've, I need to do something with my life. Because in this Great Commission thing, listen, it's not that complicated. You are either called to go or you're called to send. You're either to go down into the mine or hold the rope for those who go down. Either way, there's going to be scars on your hands. Gentlemen, show me the scars on your hands. Show me the scars on your life. Show me what it has cost you to serve Christ, to follow him, and to carry out his Great Commission. Let me see the wounds. Don't expect them to be on your son's. If you don't bear them yourself. If you don't bear them yourself, what are you doing? I don't want my boys to be millionaires or my girls to have comfortable lives. I don't care about that kind of things. I want them to be servants of Christ according to God's will for their life. They have to follow in their father's footsteps, not in my vocation, but in discipleship to the same Lord. Oh, man, if we want to raise up men, we got to be men. Yes, they're going to see fathers who are imperfect. Yes, they're going to have fathers that are going to have to go to them and say, forgive me, I blew it again. I was impatient. Yes, we're going to make mistakes. But what they need to see is a man who has wore himself out for his master, for his king, for his Lord. A man who has made decisions that have cost him dearly. That's what they need to see. A man who doesn't care about anything. But Christ's kingdom One of the ambitions is I will stand before Christ and I will give an account. I will give an account. So will you. But the greater ambition is this. And our brother alluded to it at the beginning. Verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Look at that. The love of Christ. Genitive. But make sure you understand that genitive. 
Paul is not saying that his great and enduring love for Christ constrained him. Paul is saying that Christ's enduring love for Paul constrained him. I look in the mirror, I don't... I look in the mirror at my love, I don't see much motivation. I see fickleness. I see hot and cold and warm. One of my greatest struggles in life is that I do not love him as I ought. But oh, when I look at his love for me, that's a whole different thing. That's a whole different thing. You need motivation.